Thanks. So, great pleasure to be here. Also, great pleasure to be part of the book, which uh, I think will have a lot of impact. Um, very excited about this. So, first of all, I want to say that the future is not something that happens to us, as my friend Van Heemstra says, futurist. The future is something that we create. We're not just sitting here and waiting for technology to run us over or for somebody in Silicon Valley to invent a simulation that we can live in, which they already have, right? It's called Google. Uh, but we're actually making choices about the future. We made the choice of nuclear energy, which we invented, unfortunately, invented nuclear bombs, and now we make the choice that not everybody can have one. We make those choices. And I think it's crucial that we think about what this means for our future. Um, as of half a year ago, I kind of shifted focus of my work a little bit away from the future of business, you know, i.e. making more money with technology, uh, moving to uh, uh, the future of humanity and technology. Uh, so I made a movie about this called Tech vs. Human, and you can watch it on the internet, just go to this web address, tech vs. human.com, tech vs. human.com, and also have a TV show called The Future Show, where all of that stuff is available. And of course, uh, I will make this slide available, and also from today's show at the uh, London Business School, futurewithgerd.com so you can download the whole PDF so all that stuff. If you want to download about five gigabyte of stuff, you can go to Gerd Cloud, <laughs> which is a joke really, but it's, it's a Dropbox folder, has lots of movies and uh, all my free books and about uh, 550 presentations. Don't print. <laughs> all right, so first then we talk about artificial intelligence. Let's uh, forget about Hollywood, okay? If you watched all that stuff coming out of Hollywood, this is entertainment, it's the lowest possible denominator to make money. Okay? I love those movies, I watch them, anything from Blade Runner to Oblivion to Transcendence, you know, it's interesting. But this is not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about uh, real scenarios in the next, next 20, 30 years. We're talking about scenarios that are much further removed. So let's forget about that stuff for a second, uh, if you've seen some of those. Most importantly is this curve, and I'll tell the story because I think it's a good story. Some of you may already know. Uh, exponentiality. Uh, there's a story about the invention of the chessboard. Uh, 500 before Christ in the Moti period in India, in India, a wise man went to the ruler, to the emperor, and said, he brought the chessboard along. The emperor loved the chess game. And one day they said, we'll make a bet. If you win, what do you want? The emperor said to the wise man. The wise man said, all I do is I want to feed my family. So at that point, he said, well, if you put one rice corn in the first field, and then twice as much in the second field, and twice as much in the third field, that's all I need, just rice corn. And the emperor said, well, that's cool. You're, you're a modest man. Uh, we'll do that. Right? <coughs> and as they were playing, pretty quickly, it turned out that he was going to lose the emperor to the wise man. Right? So half the way to the chessboard, the wise man had earned as much rice as all of India would produce in one year. And by the end of the game, on the 64th field, it would be enough rice to cover the entire earth in one meter of rice. Right? Because it was exponential. So, of course, the wise man was beheaded because he turned out not to have been modest. Uh, but the lesson is, yeah, we are now in the second part of the chess game. We're at the part where it really takes off. Right? The difference between two and four isn't very much on the overall scale. But the difference between you know, 50 trillion and 150 trillion is a lot. And we're now in the second part, we're at that place to where we can safely say the innovation that's happening is absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, we're living in a science fiction age. Possibly defeating cancer, Alzheimer's, solving the energy problem. I mean, the stuff that's really science fiction. I mean, just using a thing like uh, an app called Say Hi, you may know. Say Hi is an app for $2 allows you to translate in real time 34 languages through an app. So I was in Japan three months ago in a sushi restaurant. I'm speaking into the app in German, you know, regular German, not Swiss German or those kind of <laughs> aberrations, right? Uh, and the guy speaks back to me in Japanese through the app, right? And we had a real good chat about fish, not about, you know, anything deeper than that. Pretty simple stuff, right? It worked great. I had a science fiction moment right there, right? It's actually working on so, exponential technology, humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in the previous 300. 
ever since the industrial revolution. A lot of people say, oh yeah, yeah, it's a big deal, but you know, this is because it's exponential. It is truly going to be a big deal for your kids, for example, even if you don't get to live to the point to where we can be 150 years old, our kids will. Because this is a truly a mind-boggling moment. And there's two things about this. I don't know why I went to take all of a sudden. But anyway, there's two things about automation. Everything that can be automated will be. Whether it's delivery of movies or, or, or motion pictures or, or books or whatever, and anything that can become intelligent will become intelligent. Right? So our mobile phones have become intelligent. They know us. In fact, they act on our behalf already. Mobile phones have become our external brains. And this is nothing yet, just give it five years, right? I mean, this is really what companies that sell those boxes want, right? They want us to get rid of our brain and give it to them. <coughs> because it makes billions of dollars. They outsource our thinking in the, in the true sense, right? So here we have uh, the biggest trend here, of course, artificial intelligence, which is essentially is emulating human intelligence, copying it. In some way where we can do things, you know, every single technology company in Silicon Valley has major initiatives on artificial intelligence. Google has acquired over 20 companies, including two companies that make military robots using artificial intelligence. Google is no longer a search engine. It will become the biggest global brain in the world. Now, Google is going away from search, you know, searching the internet, to searching us. Now, that is really Google's mission now, searching us. And basically running a simulation for us. So when you use Google, you don't have to do much thinking. Right? Google will tell you where to go, who to talk to, who your friend is, what to buy, where you are, where you should be going, and eventually whether you should have a baby or not, for example. Then we have trends that are the reverse of this, really, is uh, intelligent assistance. And that is really a great business application. So if you're interested in that sort of you know, making more money next month. This is where you start. Intelligent assistant basically means you use technology to make life easier assisting people. For example, this is an assisted car system. The ball of the road train is not self-driving. It's a bunch of cars connected on the highway. Right? So that's the idea of I turn this around, right? IA, intelligent assist. And that makes lots of money. Lots of stuff will happen in that drift. And then we have the more ambitious part. That's artificial intelligence, right? Driving in a car while it drives itself, like driving a plane that will fly itself, right? that is a little bit further away. It is actually extremely difficult for the car to drive itself, like truly drive itself. You know, the moment, for example, when we drive a car and we have to make a decision about something that's on the road, it takes about one thousandth of a split second for us to decide to do this or that. And it's extremely complicated for the computer. This is called the Moravec uh, paradox, which is what is really hard for the computer is easy for us, and what is hard for us is easy for the computer. And that is still prevailing. So you can see that, of course, prevailing here with Siri. Right? This is a uh, difficulty to where we are looking at a situation <laughs> where uh, years ago, this was two years ago, right? he was asked Siri that we have alcohol poisoning, who tell you to drink more. Right? And just like using Google Translate, you know, basically sucked for a long time, but now, exponentially improved. If you've seen the stuff two weeks ago from the Apple event, right, you can say this is really mind-boggling, right? You can tell Siri to go and say, fetch the pictures with me and my wife on the beach in India where I'm wearing the blue hat. If I had one, right? It would search it, right? Or maybe put one on me retroactively. So, what's happening here, the FT is showing, this is, you know, if, if you're interested in business stuff, this is the place to go, right? Intelligent assistance everywhere. What we're, what we're doing on Google Maps or Gmail or all the other stuff will absolutely explode in every single part of society. Education, training, banking, intelligent assistance, augmentation. That's kind of the obvious part, right? And then we have the really tempting part, the numbers. Uh, this is a study from uh, Tata and also McKinsey. The, the potential economic impact of all the disruptive technology, automation, robotics, vehicles, Internet of Things, mobile internet, $30 trillion. When we talk about the huge amount of money, yet now you, can, you don't have to wonder why so many companies are going into this and saying, well, we're not even mentioning now technology. Right? This is a mind-boggling shift here. And then, as a result, we have the so-called unicorns. You heard about the unicorns? 
Unicorns are companies that are worth over a billion dollars that are privately funded. No stock market, no banks, right? 86 of them. Unfortunately, only three in Europe, the rest in the US and China. 86 companies. And all that stuff is happening in California. Unicorns are extreme money makers for the investors, of course. Right? And here's what Peter Diamandis has to say, who is uh, one of the founders of many companies and runs uh, Singularity University. I got this email from him yesterday. He started a company called Human Longevity Inc. This is not science fiction, this is actually real. Uh, to where they want to end aging or at least delay it. Right? Um, and this is what he says in his email. The astonishing part here is that should give us pause to think, right? He's basically saying, okay, there's six to seven trillion dollars a year spent on healthcare, people over 65, and uh, these people hold something of the order of 60 trillion dollars in, in wealth. And the question is, what would people pay for an extra 10, 20, 30, 40 years of a healthy life? It's a big opportunity. In other words, it's about money. If you're rich, you can be old, you can be happy, you can buy all the stuff you need, and buy a new liver, and everybody else can go and bugger off. <laughs> so, that begs the question. When we have exponential digitization, optimization, virtualization, and robotization, I call this the Asians, because there's so many of them, society changes. That media is first, as you know, I, I come from the music business, so media was first robotized, essentially, right? It made completely superfluous, and now it's coming to logistics, transportation, telecom. In the telecom business, hundreds of thousands of people are working to run the network. Well, the future is, yeah, robots will run the network. I mean, this is not this is not about emotions. Right? It's about running a network. Right? If you're running a container ship, you have unmanned container ships. You need two people to be on the boat. Now you have what? 400. You know, this is happening pretty much. Financial services, lawyers, legal discovery, legal discovery already done by software can be done by smart robots. Not all of it, but a very large chunk by paralegals. Don't be a parallel in the future. <laughs> Fran Osborne last year said 58% of financial advisors will be replaced by robots. And I think that's a lie. It's actually going to be 80%. Anything that can be automated will be. And so we're moving up the food chain right, to a place that cannot be automated. Creative lawyers, right? Creative. Creative lawyers, yeah, they exist, yeah? People who can actually make up stuff, you know, who have human capacity. So, I would not say, for example, what's happening if we don't need lawyers. Of course we need lawyers, right? But the low-hanging fruit of, of figuring out what's what can be done by software, just like a call center will be 95% software in the future. I mean, what's a call center then? Just, you know, speech recognition, basically. So, in this world, the complete convergence of man and machine. That's what's happening today. And I would agree with Gray on this, that this is what's happening, and we cannot go back and say, can we unmerge man to machine? But we have to decide what we want to do here. How far do we want to take this? Do we want women not to be able to have a body, a, a baby in, inside their body and have natural birth? Because it is cheaper, less dangerous, faster, cleaner to have a baby outside of your body. It would save a lot of money if we were not to do things that make us human, like lie, make mistakes, get drunk, buy the wrong food, smoke cigarettes. Yeah, it would be cheaper and you know, it would basically turn us into a giant machine. Do we want to go down this way? This is your house. This is your This, is a, uh, this is your film about Jibo. These are your things. The first family robot. This is a real proposal funded on Kickstarter for, I think, $2 million. This is a robot that sits in your kitchen and that you talk to, and the picture of the founder, this is not a robot, not a robot, it's a family member. And there is 14 companies that are doing this, including Amazon, a thing called the Echo. So, as my good friend uh, Sophocles said, just recently, not in English, however, nothing but en enters the life of mortals without a curse. 
All these things are becoming possible. I can have a robot in my bloodstream treating my cholesterol. I have high cholesterol. That would be nice, right? But all the unintended consequences of this and the possibility of saying, yes, you know, I can stop Alzheimer's by genetic engineering, I can, I can also design a baby. And who would get to do that? So here we have issues that are basically like this, right? You can make nuclear power with nuclear energy. If you consider that good, I would consider that positive, possibly positive, right? If it works, it doesn't blow up. Oh, you can make bombs. Technology is 98% the same. So artificial intelligence has the same potential. Has vast potential of positive kinds, you know, efficiency, optimization, and, and which company would not like to fire half of their employees, right? I mean, for practical reasons, it saves money, right? I mean, that's what companies do. They save money, maximize profit, pay themselves more shares. So that leads to the thing that we've seen, we've seen in many really movies like the Minority Report. And then our good friend Mark Zuckerberg, who we know for real respect and privacy and personal rights on Facebook, uh, he started a new company called Vicarious, where he's saying we're building software that thinks and learns like a human. That's the headline of the company, right? Of course, all the investors in Silicon Valley are celebrating with excitement. Because we can copy humans with the software, apparently. Software that thinks like a human. We want to detain super intelligence using technology, right? That's the problem. So rather than having 500 people doing our CRM or so, or ERP or whatever you call it in companies, we have two people. It's possible. Because we can use IBM Watson to decide who gets what and who gets fired, who gets hired. IBM has a chip called the Neurosynaptic Chip. It's a chip that is mirrored after the human brain. This is already happening. Schwab is using a, a new thing called the Intelligent Portfolio, which is their Volvo advisor. Schwab intends to swap out tens of thousands of people working for Schwab to advise people on financial investment with an iPad, with something that lives on the network. So here's the problem with all of this stuff we have discussed, right? Technology does not have ethics. And you know, if I speak in, in, uh, in America, people say, well, so for what? <laughs> ethics is nice to have. <laughs> you know, if we can afford it, uh, you know, we can afford ethics these days, you know. Uh, if, if I speak in Switzerland, they say, oh my god, you know. <laughs> so I mean, it's, this is important stuff, right? If technology doesn't have ethics, would you trust a robot to take care of the social contract or the norms or the values? How would a system like that even know our values? I mean, if it knew it, it would have to be programmed into it, right? But it's way too mushy for that, too ephemeral to actually be done in this way. Right? Blinking, so it's important. <laughs> so, <coughs> we're moving into a world that is this on one hand, Completed digital, and I would agree with Gray, it's inevitable, right? It's happening. There's not much we can do about that. But on the other hand, we have this, right? That's what makes us human. And I'm not even talking about religion or any, any of those things, right? I'm talking about just practical matters, you know, standards, codex, social contract. And those two things have to merge somehow. Who decides all these things? Will we let those companies that have invented the tech? that makes $2 trillion dollars a year decide on what is good for us on a social level, right? that would not be a good idea. I mean, we already know that Facebook wants to be our government, right? Basically, replace the government. And that Google wants to be the OS that we live in. Right? I mean, right? so, what about consciousness, embodiment, our body, right? We do have a body, some of us. Uh, this was the problem, of course, in the movie Her. That's why it didn't work out, because it turns out, have you seen the movie Her? Yeah. The computer was having sex with 4,850 4, other people at the same time, right? Kind of a problem for the guy. <laughs> but anyway, embodiment, <laughs> the awareness, sentience, purpose, right? All those weird things. 
Human lives exist 95% of that stuff. The rest is algorithm. Uploading our brain? What a crazy idea, right? I mean, I can upload, if I could do that, the pictures remained in my memory, right? But that would be like saying, okay, I go to TripAdvisor and everything that's good, good on TripAdvisor, I just go wherever it says it's good. Right? You know TripAdvisor can be good, but mostly it's just a tiny slice of reality. It's useful, but it's not real. It's not real. When you stand in front of the restaurant, you're looking inside, you're smelling the food, you see the people, you have 100% reality in four seconds. Do you get that on Twitter, by no, It's useful, but it's not real. It's not the actual thing. Right? Like having sex with a cyber robot is not the same as having sex with your wife. And even though some people want us to believe that. So we're going to move in a world like this, right? a world that is machine-based, with jobs taken like this. What will our kids do? Will our kids be making the keyboard for the robot? <laughs> I mean, Let's not kill ourselves, right? This time, this time, it has been said many times before, but this time, technological unemployment is real. Very real. Because it's not just the stupid, you know, people who are doing like assembly stuff or sweeping the lawns or picking up our garbage, you know, the low hanging fruit jobs. Right? It's the white color jobs, it's our jobs. In fact, this for the first time this year, at a TED talk, there's going to be a robot giving a TED talk. <laughs> Well, I don't think there's much of a difference. The other guys are robots as well. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, TED Talks, after all, right? You just have to have safe the world and make money, and then you're fine. But this time it's real, right? So, what Luther King already said a few years ago, it's going to come down to this, right? The basic income guarantee. That sounds like socialism, maybe. Do we have a choice? when 50% of our kids aren't working. Because there are no low-hanging fruit jobs. And not everybody can be a designer, or a therapist, or a cook, or a carpenter for that matter. So the future of work really is this. Uh, will we ride on top of technology, or will it crush us? And I maintain that if we don't watch out, it will crush us. We need to take a look at this and say, what do we need to do to ride on top of technology? Who will control this? Who has the say about this? Should it be the ones that make these? Well, not really. These companies are more powerful than any oil company, any energy company in the world. The data is the new oil. We should not allow those people to be unregulated. Like That would be like saying BP and Exxon Mobile don't have to regulate. It's about this, our future, and eh? this is going to happen. Actually, there's too many humans in this picture. This will happen. Our future is this, right? So the idea of what else is going on that is going on over here? I mean, what makes us human in terms of work? And I think is everything that can be automated will be, everything else will explode in value. Can you automate understanding? Can you automate uh, negotiation? Intuition, imagination, empathy. Well, some of it maybe you can emulate, right? Sooner or later. But do you really want to live in a simulation? And that idea is, I think that's madness. I mean, to voluntarily want to do that? Sorry. He's like Asimov said, don't animate now. About the future of work, and this we said this 50 years ago or something. He says he doesn't want to be a speed reader, somebody that can do this, become a super brain. Right? <coughs> he wants to be a speed understanding and understanding. Our only chance in the future is to be speed understanding, because that's what we can do, right? <coughs> understanding stuff. If you have a tough uh, a challenge in, in court, a business challenge, an environmental challenge, you need people to understand stuff, not just for stuff. Most interaction between people when people are speaking is not about what I say, it's about what I don't say. What you see in between the lines. I mean, that, that's the important part. That's how you would know you can trust me or not by what I don't say. So how much do you believe in technology? Is 
that the you know, the holy grail is technology can solve all that stuff. All we have to do is sign up and say, yes, I agree with the terms of use. I think human assistance is a lot more than that. A lot more than turning it into algorithms. And this has precedent, right? This card held 1662. That basically an animal is a machine and can be copied to be like a machine, right? So people have built animals, ducks. Right? Unfortunately, the original one got lost by Beaupassant. There's a bunch of other ones that are actual mobs that you can feed and it goes to, you know, comes out the other end. It's a machine, right? And that has been referred to as reductionism. Reducing an apparatus into the most essential part. Can the duck eat and Yes, so it's a duck, right? <laughs> that is stupid. I mean, think about that for a second. And we are we are people because we can set up an engine that once we were downloaded, we were born. For the time being, and guess what? There are people who want us to be downloaded or uploaded. Right? That is a very bad idea. I mean, it works both ways, right? project ourselves into this, and then everything that we do is mediated and shared in some way. Think about this for a second. When you're watching a, a clip on video, on YouTube or wherever, you look at this, and it's quite nice to see stuff like that. We can see everything now, really. It's five to 10% of that reality that we're watching through mediation, right, through mediated object at the screen. When you're on the beach in Goa, like I was just a few days ago uh, in Kerala, on this very beach here, right, I get 100% of what it actually is. The mediated experience is not the same as the actual experience. It's not. Right? It's nice to have, it's useful, but it's an approximation. And technology has the potential of saying, well, we can use it to self-enforce itself, right? to actually amplify itself. That would be a very, very tough choice. I mean, look at this. What about this, the social contract? <coughs> we don't need a social contract for artificial intelligence says, why do we do this? How can we do it? Who is it for? Who benefits for it? It's just as important as nuclear energy. And I'll be done very soon. This uh, little bubble thing here shows basically what I think is the future. We have two bubbles, you know, we have the technology bubble and then we have the human bubble. And what we need to do is figure out a way that it fits together. We cannot stop technology. We don't want to stop technology. But we don't want it to run us. We don't want to become technology because, you know, it makes money. Right? It works for some people, it would not work for me. We have to think about what I call the human imperative. The ultimate goal of business is happiness. It's actually not to make money. I mean, making money is the result of happiness, right? Or the other way around. The state of Bhutan has a principle of gross national happiness. They're defining it as GDP. So what we need to think about is what is that imperative? Where does it go? Because things are now disrupted, like Uber is disrupting the taxi industry, right? They also have to construct stuff. Right? They also have to come up with stuff that fits. So the final slide here, this is a key question, right? Do we delete humanity? Because you know it's cumbersome, it's wetware, it's complicated, it's not honest. It's you know, it's not efficient, it's not productive, it's not, you know, optimized, whatever, right? Or do we make it do this? Technology should do this. Right? Liberate us to do what we could do best. Not my source. Thanks very much for your time.